thing that, that uh, we could probably all agree on is that um, one of the reasons you version data is because uh, keeping history of that information is very important. And here are a couple of examples that um, I like to talk about. Um, on, the, on the left, we have a map of the former Yugoslavia uh, country. And right now, we have six sovereign nations. Uh, that's as a result of the war in the 90s. Um, the map on the right is also kind of striking. Uh, this is the, uh, in case you can read it from the back, uh, this is the ethnic distribution of, uh, in Bosnia uh, before and after the war. Um, so we, it's important to keep track of these changes, uh, be those political, uh, physical, natural, uh, in the way we represent um, our information. And that's what a lot of people think about when they think about versioning information, they think about historical information. But that's not the only reason we may want to version information. Um, we create versions of data for many different reasons. Uh, people might be collaborating on the same da data set uh, concurrently, for instance. Um, or you may want to see a different uh, view of, of the world, of, of reality. Uh, and you may want to prove a point based on that. Um, we argue that we need better tools uh, for this. Uh, the state of the art in the industry um, um, is, is good, but there are new models, new ways of working that require uh, new tools, and we, we like to talk about those today. So the other way looks something like this. Uh, you have a lot of people that are trying to collaborate. They are part of a team. Uh, usually they work with data, they modify data. And what usually uh, ends up happening is that you have groups of people uh, that are collaborating through a big um, um, relational database, usually. Uh, that's where the uh, versioning happens. Uh, another group of people uh, do something kind of similar. And this other person is uh, left wondering, how can I extract some of those changes from those two groups? Uh, maybe not all of them, because I may not be interested in every change that happened. Uh, but how can I pick and choose uh, the changes that I'm interested in? Uh, do that in real time. Uh, and when I want to do it, not you know when when it happens in the database, uh, this kind of workflow becomes um, a little bit cumbersome with a single um, point of, of versioning, which is a, a database. Uh, we can think of it uh, in a new way. Um, this works. Uh, you can think of this as a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, everyone is uh, exchanging information about their versions, and everyone has a full copy of the history of of the uh, data sets. Uh, that might sound like a lot of information, but the way we've solved this with GeoGit is uh, as optimal as it can be. So you're not really uh, copying every, with every version, with every new version, you're not copying a lot of data. You're just copying the changes that happen to that data. So it, it can become fairly efficient, and we can all uh, exchange different uh, pieces of information with each other. Uh, there is no single central point where the versioning happens. Uh, everyone is participating. In the versioning, we can uh, exchange information with uh, our peers. Uh, we can also um, institute some sort of centralized uh, versioning system that becomes a uh, um, organizational decision, not a technical limitation. Um, we argue that this is better for many reasons, and I just uh, like to offer these three. Um, first of all, it doesn't have a single point of failure. Um, these days, with uh, relational databases, we've gotten really good at guaranteeing um, um, uptime and um, you know uh, fault tolerance, et cetera, but it can still go down. You can still f find that a data center goes down, that a system is not available, and in that case, you can't work. You can't just connect to somewhere, do your versioning, keep adding versions, et cetera. So uh, with this distributed model, we, we don't have a single point of failure. You can still keep adding versions to your data locally. Um, there is no single source of truth for geospatial information with this model. And this actually kind of scares a lot of people and uh, is a little bit controversial because uh, we hear a lot about authoritative uh, data sets and people owning information and you know making the canonical copy of something. But the reality of it is that um, people just, data wants to be free. Uh, the data wants to be copied, wants to be uh, used for different purposes. And once that happens, I probably want to create my own version of that data uh, for whatever reason. My copy of the road network might be different from the transportation uh, planning department. Um, so it's good. It's good that we can actually do this and keep track of the uh, provenance of the information. And uh, these two aspects actually result in a better 
a model for sharing and collaboration on, on spatial information. So our approach to these problems and to this idea is a, a project called GeoGit. Um, it's an open source project, has a BSD license. Uh, it's built in Java. And uh, that's the website in case uh, people want to uh, check it out, take a look. There's a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, you can download the software. Uh, there's a couple of uh, tutorials and workshops that you can go through and, and take a look. Um, it is part of the Location Tech uh, Working Group uh, for the Eclipse Foundation. We're really excited about that. Uh, we're going through that process now. Uh, and this is uh, with the intention to provide a tool that's uh, in a vendor neutral space. We would like to see uh, this concept grow. Uh, and uh, we would like to see different implementations on top of different software. So how many of you are developers? How many developers here? OK, quite a few. So this is the easy uh, audience. Um, how many have worked with uh, Git? All right, still quite a few. So uh, GeoGit actually follows the Git model uh, quite closely. And um, there's a few new concepts uh, that you have to be aware of. And um, as I'll show later, you don't have to know uh, this uh, very precisely um, by using other types of tools. But if you're working with the low level um, uh, command line interface, you should know at least uh, what this means. So usually we have uh, data, uh, spatial data somewhere. That's uh, in the form of um, files. They could be shape files, geojson files, etc. cetera. Um, usually also you'll have uh, something like a spatial database. Uh, be that Postgres or Oracle Spatial, etc. And uh, what GeoGit does is it keeps uh, track of the changes that you made in, in this uh, in these data sets. And in order to do that, it has to import that information into the work, what we call the working tree. This is where you're going to be modifying information, right? Um, and then there's a, a, a sort of a two-stage uh, um, saving uh, mechanism where First, you, you add the information to the staging area. Uh, at that point, you're flagging that information as version, and GeoGit will keep track of those changes. And then when you, whenever you're ready to do a uh, what is called a commit, a new point in the history gets created. So that's a new version, basically, on your, on your repository. Um, as we saw from the previous slides, um, the, the nice thing about this model is that it can be uh, remote. So there's also a few operations to work with uh, remote repositories, you can uh, push changes to a remote repository or pull changes from remote repositories and keep uh, all these um, data sets uh, in sync, basically. So this, uh, the, the power of this model is uh, enabled by the, uh, this concepts of uh, branching and merging, um, which may sound uh, alien to, to uh, GIS analysts or to GIS people, but it's, it's actually fairly simple. Um, the idea is we have uh, a main line of, of uh, uh, a main version um, with uh, its history points that's represented on the left side by that master branch. Uh, that's my, my canonical copy of my data. And whenever I want to make a change, whenever someone wants to make a change, uh, what they do is they create a, a branch. A branch is a, a divergence in the uh, history of that uh, information of that data set, and I can make uh, changes in that branch. I am isolated with, uh, from what happens on, on master. Um, master actually can get uh, new edits, new changes, so the history keeps advancing and the versioning keeps advancing. And whenever I'm ready to bring these changes on this branch back to master, I do what is called a merge. Um, at that point, GeoGit will detect if there are any conflicts with those uh, edits, because I may have modified uh, a polygon that someone else also modified or maybe deleted or maybe they changed the attributes, right? So GeoGit will tell you uh, what uh, conflicts you may have and you have to uh, solve those. Um, GeoGit doesn't solve them automatically. Uh, this tool is not designed to, uh, to do that uh, because uh, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes uh, uh, it's, uh, it requires human innovation. Uh, we could always uh, add some scripting on top of this. That's certainly possible, but uh, GeoGit will not make a decision for you on which of the two copies is the good one. Uh, that's something that you have to implement uh, on a workflow. So I get it quite, uh, asked this question a lot. Like um, a lot of people say, okay, why don't you just use Git with uh, GeoJSON files? And um, it's, it's a good solution uh, if you are uh, willing to cope with the limitations of, the, of that um, format. 
Uh, GeoJSON is a great uh, format for representing uh, geospatial information on, on, a, on, a, web, uh, on a web map. Um, but it's not really um, a, a format that re uh, will support versioning for large data sets. Um, Git uh, itself wasn't built with uh, large binary files in mind. So we did try to actually implement GeoGit on top of Git directly, and this just didn't scale, didn't work. Um, and also this workflow has a pretty uh, big gaps with uh, integration with other tools. Uh, there's no integration with desktop tools, other GIS servers, etc. cetera. So um, by all means, if, uh, if you can use this, uh, do it because uh, the GitHub tools are pretty, pretty awesome and, and they can actually um, help you with your workflow, but uh, we're trying to add to, to that idea by supporting bigger files and, and more specialized workflows. So why, why do this? Why would we want to uh, version information? And uh, why do we want to keep those versions around? I'm going to offer three. There, there are many more, but I'm just going to offer three here today. Uh, the first one is a classical GIS uh, operation where you're studying different alternatives uh, for, let's say, a road that's being built. And you want to study their, maybe their environmental impact or something like that. So you may want to keep those versions around. You may want to run models on those versions uh, separately. Um, and it's very easy to change from one version to the other because it's, that's just a, an operation that's called a checkout. And they all live in the same repository. Uh, what usually ends up happening is that when you're done with this process, you throw the, the alternatives that didn't get chosen. You throw them away or you store them somewhere. Uh, with this model, they can just live on a branch and you can access them at any time. Another uh, classical example of uh, why you would want to do versioning is crowdsourcing. Uh, very hot topic these days. Uh, a lot of people want to do this. And um, it presents some challenges for your IT infrastructure and your systems people. They will probably freak out when you tell them that you're going to open up a database and that people are going to write to it. Uh, that means that they'll have to implement a lot of uh, safeguards and security protocols. And there's always the concern that that database is going to be corrupted. Uh, Etc. So an easy way to approach this problem is to just offer a branch for for crowdsourcing, and someone or some process can actually pick and choose uh, whatever changes are good for your production production based database and bring those into your organization. Um, the other one is uh, OpenStreetMap. How many people have worked with uh, OpenStreetMap data? Right, quite a few. So. Uh, OpenStreetMap is a worldwide crowdsourced uh, vector street map. Um, it's very detailed. Uh, sometimes it's better than the commercial providers in some areas. And a lot of people want to use it within their organization, which is something that sounds like a no-brainer, but it's actually not that easy. So with uh, GeoGit, this is what you do to actually ingest uh, OSM data into your uh, GeoGit repository. It's just a couple of commands, as you can see here. Uh, the first one is uh, just downloading a section of OSM. I'm just passing a, a bounding box, and that, that's actually the greater London area. And it'll just clip that area and download everything. At that point, I create a new repository, and uh, everything that I do to it is going to be versioned. So I can, I can keep track of the changes that I do locally to my OSM um, data. But I, I also want to keep track of what the community keeps doing into the, to the data set. I want to get the updates that the crowd is doing into OSM. Uh, so that's what the second command allows me to do. Uh, it'll just bring in whatever changes happen to OSM, uh, calculate the differences, and put those into my GeoGit repository. And actually, if there are some conflicts uh, between the, the changes that I did and the ones that the crowd did, it'll also tell me, and I'll decide uh, what to do with those. Uh, we can actually filter as well. Uh, this is a, a mapping file. Uh, it follows the uh, overpass API um, language. So I can not only get everything uh, in a certain area, but I can also say maybe I'm only interested in the highways or only the bridges or uh, something like that. And finally, we can also uh, contribute back to OSM. If we create new data uh, in GeoGit, there's an export command that will allow me to uh, produce a, a, a PBF file that I can then take into an OSM editor and put it into the, uh, the crowdsource map, the public map. So it's a, it's a nice workflow for um, using and also giving back to OSM. 
So right now, uh, GeoGit has um, released a few versions. Uh, we just released uh, um, about a month ago um, version 0.8. Uh, we're actively working on releasing 0 0.9. Uh, there's a complete command line interface um, tool that comes with GeoGit when you download it. Um, I like to say that it's feature complete. Uh, by that I mean that it's usable, you can start using it. It's being used in, the, in production in some projects like we'll see uh, in the next talk. Um, but we're, we're still working on tweaking things, the internal structure, uh, optimizing some uh, operations, performance, etc. And we hope to reach uh, 1.0 um, in a couple of months or so. Uh, here are some examples um, of the command line, uh, just to, to give you a sense of what they look like. Uh, a log will show me the, uh, the commits, the different points in history. Uh, the second one is kind of the, 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 the feature that matters here, which is uh, a geospatial diff. Uh, it's not complete because I had to cut the screen, but you can see already that there's a poly on there. So it's detecting changes in geography. And I'll show that um, in a second in the demo. So that's the core GeoGit project. Um, at Balance, we're working on uh, some additional tools around this, uh, this core uh, library. Uh, we're adding a Python library that allow you, would allow you to automate some of these uh, processes um, in an easier, more accessible language, uh, such as Python. Uh, we're also implementing a high-performance GeoGit server that will expose many of these operations through a RESTful API that outputs uh, JSON and GeoJSON, like you see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, we are also working on a QGIS plugin. Um, so, you know, uh, GIS analyst uh, will be able to access this functionality without touching the command line, without having to know about GeoJSON and, and those things. Uh, we're also adding uh, web components for um, web mapping uh, applications. And we're always working on uh, supporting larger deployments, larger repositories, uh, performance optimizations, uh, et cetera. And I am going to try to give you a small, short demo of some of these things. So, let's see. So, uh, resolution is not very good. I apologize for that, but you can get a, uh, an idea. This is the uh, the GIGIT plugin that we are working on with um, with QGIS. Uh, so here you can see here's the history of my repositories, all the things that I did to those data sets. Um, I'm working with this uh, buildings uh, layer uh, from OSM. This is uh, actually in, um, um, in Ethiopia. So as you can see, I have a, a Bing layer. It's a bit dark, but it, this is a aerial uh, photography, uh, and, and there's a few buildings that have been uh, digitized already. So um, this tells me here, I don't know if you can read this, but it's, uh, we are currently the, in the edits branch. So I created a branch, I'm editing information, and I'm just going to add a few, or maybe one, um, polygon here. So hopefully the internet works for the base map, and I can do something meaningful. This data is actually currently in a PostGIS database um, that's running locally. Uh, so I'm going to create a, a polygon here. And forgive me for my lack of precision, but I'm just going to digitize something like this. All right, so I create a new polygon. I click OK. Um, it's, a, it's a new entry into my database. I'm going to save the edits. And the GeoGit plugin is going to ask me if I want to import this into the GeoGit repository to create a new version, which I'll say yes. And it will immediately ask me why. Why did I do this? What's my commit message? What, what is the operation that I, that I did? So I'm going to add a building, right? And as you'll see, the, the list gets uh, updated. This is a new entry into my uh, history list, uh, a new point in my, in my versioning. And it's in my edits branch. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, uh, actually change my branch. I'm going to go to master. That's my main version uh, branch. You can see that that last commit is not here. And I'm going to merge that from the other branch. And this is one person working on two branches, but you can see where this is going. Uh, you can have people collaborating this way and, and adding changes. So there's my new commit um, that I just uh, created. 
Um, the other thing we can do is um, there's, a, as I said, a, a server that we also are working on. Uh, so that looks something like this. Uh, this is the same repository exposed um, as in the form of uh, several layers. And uh, as you can see, this is a web map display with uh, the same information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to push these changes to the server so I can view them in a, in a, web, in a web display. So for that, I can just do a sync with the server which is already configured for this repository. And what it'll do is it'll first uh, pull the changes from the remote repository in case someone else uh, you know, made some changes. And then it's going to push my changes to it. And um, if that is successful, which it looks like it did, I'm going to redraw this. And you see this polygon just showed up here, which wasn't there before. Um, we also have some um, tools to kind of see um, you know, all this history, all these commits, and be able to actually view the changes before and after a commit was made. This one was just one polygon, it's not very interesting. Um, I'll offer you another view that's a bit more complete, uh, which is probably this one. So for instance here, the green ones are polygons that were added, the red ones were deleted, and I think down here is one that was modified, the blue one. So you can see the blue one was just slightly moved. Maybe you know it wasn't digitized in the right place. Um, so that's what we are working on, uh, GeoGit and its uh, growing ecosystem. Um, again, we uh, I'd like to stress that we think this is a better model for editing, versioning, and collaboration because of the reasons that I that I shared before and. Um, Thank you very much for, for your time, and I'll be happy to uh, chat with you later if you have any questions or want to know more. Thank you.